Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Keeping It Simple. Leading the discussion today, as always, are Harley Bassman and Michael Green, but we are excited to have friend of Simplify and semi-celebrity Corey Hofstein. For those of you who don't know Corey, uh, first off, shame on you. The man is a national treasure. But he's, he's better known as co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. But Corey may be better known for his, uh, his social media platforms and his podcast, Flirting with Models, and YouTube channel, Pirates of Finance. So Corey and his, newfound, his firm, Newfound, provide some phenomenal content and solutions. And this week, Newfound and Simplify are really excited to announce a partnership where we're launching, and, and Corey's launching, the Structural Alpha ETF model portfolio. So this is a really organic thing that came about as Corey was an early adopter of Simplify's ETFs. And one of the requests that Simplify has gotten really consistently was a demand for you know, how to utilize our strategies within the broader context of a full portfolio. So Corey and his, found new, uh, and his, and his firm Newfound are going to provide that. So to read the room, let's, uh, let's start off with a question, and, uh, and this would be kind of a crux of the conversation today. But uh, Rania, will you launch the first poll? So audience, do you use leverage in your or your client portfolios? Yes, no, but open to it, or no, because leverage is dangerous. So please answer away. And with that, uh, might keep an eye on the poll results, but let me turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I was trying to answer that poll, by the way. It, it would not accept my submission. So you're going to get an untainted perspective. Um, so welcome, everybody. I'm glad to have everyone back in the room. And last time, uh, we had an unbelievable uh, show with Jeff Snyder and I ganging up on Harley, beating him into submission. He's now become an inflationary bear, and he's totally decided that rates are going to stay low forever. <laughs> this time, we're going to try to introduce leverage into the equation and force Harley to accept that risk parity is the future for all portfolios. <laughs> so nobody is better off to do that, and it's a great way to start off with a poll. As we look at it, as we look at the, the answers to the question of, do we apply leverage to a portfolio? And I'm joking about the risk parity dynamics. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the difference between risk parity and what Corey has highlighted as return stacking. But one of the things that is really interesting is, is that the ability to lever portfolios, the ability to use more than 100% of a portfolio to construct a return profile that has additional diversification benefits that potentially offers higher returns, is increasingly becoming a necessity in an environment in which bonds simply don't offer an adequate return profile for most investors. And so that's a great place to, to kind of launch in and introduce Corey. And Corey, maybe you can start us off by saying, by, by talking a little bit about your thesis of return stacking and what that means in the context of a portfolio composition. Well, thank you guys for having me here today. Really excited to chat about this. Really excited to get into an argument with Harley at some point about risk parity, which is when the fireworks I'm sure will go off. But let's start with the thesis of what is return stacking, where this whole concept really came from. And I need to give credit to my good friend, Rodrigo Gordillo at Resolve Asset Management for coming up with the name return stacking. He and I actually wrote a paper about it last fall. The whole idea of what we're trying to achieve is recognizing that investors who are allocated to a traditional strategic asset allocation portfolio, you know, a mixture between global stocks and bonds, predominantly allocated, you know, when we talk to advisors or endowments towards some sort of 60-40 model, are facing increasing headwinds. Now, I know that has been the story since like 2013. And if you listen to that, everyone's been wrong. It's been a phenomenal ride for the 60-40. What we do know going forward, and I won't even try to predict what's happening with stocks, is we do know the 40 is getting more and more costly from an opportunity cost perspective. That the return for bonds is really just mathematical. When Whatever you buy for your starting yield is a phenomenal predictor of the ultimate return you're going to get. And so with real yields as low as they are, that 40 is a very costly allocation. <laughs> to front run Harley, because I know he's going to get into this, the other potential problem facing the 60-40 going forward, which we haven't really had to deal with over the last 20 or 30 years, 
is that inflation risk flips the correlation that we've traditionally seen between stocks and bonds. When the headline risk for markets is economic growth shocks, we tend to see negative correlation between stocks and bonds. But when that flips to inflationary risk, what we see is that that correlation starts to go positive. And so the risk of a traditional 60-40 starts to go way up. And so the uh, idea of return uh, hold, stacking- Hold on one second. I just want to interject on that because I want to make sure that we're capturing this. So first of all, when you say correlation between stocks and bonds, you're referring to bond prices, not bond yields per se, yes. right? I just yes. want to emphasize that. So we're looking at the aggregate return within the portfolio in the- you know, basically since 1997, we've had an environment in the United States where if equities sell off, it is highly likely that bonds are rallying and therefore a portfolio that is split between bonds and equities is cushioned and in some ways protected, right? That's yeah. lowering the volatility of the aggregate portfolio, even as the volatility of the underlying assets themselves may be unaffected, right? Yep. They're zigging and zagging at different times. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. And prior to 1997, the environment was largely one that I would describe as bonds reflected the Fed's desire to take away the economic punch bowl, right? So if the economy was getting too hot, the Fed would raise interest rates that would lower the price of bonds and in turn create the perception or the expectation that growth was going to slow, which would hit assets like equities, right? Reduce the allocation to equities. Post-1997, that's been different. We've enjoyed the benefits associated with this and strategies like risk parity have benefited in particular from the negative correlation between the two asset classes because it has created effectively an embedded put in the portfolio construction dynamics. Is that a reasonable summary of kind of what's happened for the past 25 years? Are we really going right into risk parity right out of the We're gate? We're not going right now. <laughs> We're not going right now. But but that, I will, that dynamic, I will, the portfolio protection associated with bonds, has been a critical feature of the performance that we've experienced. Absolutely. Over the last 25, 30 years, that protection feature, that, that bonds have gone up when equities have gone down, and vice versa, has brought a tremendous amount of stability to the 60-40 portfolio. The mechanics of why that has happened, we might quibble over, but the realization has happened regardless that that 60-40 portfolio has had one of the highest sharp ratios in recorded history. And so it, the question going forward is, is if, an, if inflation remains a headline risk and correlation between stocks and bonds go up and they start to zig and zag at the same time, what does that mean for the risk of a 60-40 investor? Let's, 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 okay, so keep, let's, keep going. Let's, oh. let's, put a pin, let's put a pin in that idea about correlations. I want to talk about that, but not quite yet. Let's dial back to the real guts of what's going on here, which is the use of leverage. And I think it's really important for us to define what leverage is because it's not always the same thing. I think a lot of people get, get hung up. You could have balanced leverage, um, like owning a stock or a bond. They go up and down one for one. You have unbalanced leverage. Um, a, a risk parity portfolio um, might offer that, and, and then you could have like non-recourse leverage, where you own an option, so you have your downside is clipped. So there's different ways of getting leverage, and then there's the bigger deal, which is you could have nominal leverage or risk leverage. Nominal leverage is where you could, let's say, one portfolio you buy the five-year treasury. Another portfolio is you buy the five years futures contract and you put the cash into a, a T-bill. Now the risk of those two, ignoring rates moving a lot from the three month uh, rate, the risk is identical. But in the second case, you have two line items. You have $2 million, whereas, whereas the first you only have one. M most people will call that leverage, whereas people like us would not. We look at risk leverage. Um, and a lot of people are, are, are constrained from actually using nominal leverage. Um, uh, a lot of the places where I work, once upon a time, we're very good at using futures combined with cash or floaters to create a portfolio that might be 30, 40, 50 basis points better than the index. And by the way, if you make 30 or 40 basis points for 20 years, uh, you know what they call you? Uh, the bond they king. They call you the bond king, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you could go stack the first eight year dollar futures. So that's $8 million. And that's the same as on the two-year note. 
So that's one idea. The other idea that you're going to be dealing with here really, I think, is risk leverage, where we actually add risk on top of risk. So risk parity portfolio, uh, the classic one uh, would be um, you have $100, you buy $130 of bonds, you buy $70 of equities. So you have $200 total invested, boy, 100 bucks. As long as those things go like this, as they have in the last couple of decades, and it's just it. 130 to 70 or 120 to 80, that depends upon the correlations. That's all fine, but you have real risk there and you have, in theory, you can lose all your capital. So why don't you respond to the idea of how do you view leverage and how do you want to deploy it? It's a lot to digest here. And you <laughs> keep steering me towards 60-40, Harley, and I'm trying to avoid going down that rabbit hole because it's going to take us a whole hour to Actually, to I'm steering you that. towards risk parity to trap you in that. I know you are. We're going to avoid it. So so I'm actually going to completely ignore your question and come back to it because I think I want to I want to go back to this 60-40 yep. for a moment and talk about what people have been doing and why I don't think it's sufficient going forward and why we're introducing this idea of return stacking. So let's rewind to 2012, 2013. The narrative is the 60-40 is dead. This is the drum that's been beaten for the last decade. What do people start doing? Well, one thing that they start doing is they start increasing their risk level. So they sell down bonds and buy equities. That actually was a trade that worked out phenomenally well. But all you're really doing is just taking on more risk in your portfolio, right? That's a very explicit risk trade-off. The other thing that people did is they introduced alternatives into their portfolio. Those have been, despite uh, many of them being strong diversifiers, things like managed futures or absolute return hedge funds, they were very disappointing from an absolute return perspective relative to stocks and bonds. And then what we've seen in, in the private world is just an explicit admission that they don't even want to think about risk anymore, that they're just stuffing everything in private so that they don't even have to measure risk on a daily basis. Because there's no mark to market. Because there's no mark to market. Exactly. And that, and what's funny is that was sort of like always said behind the scenes. And now it's just explicitly people are saying there's actually a real benefit to just being able to ignore the day-to-day -day risk. So here we are today, it's 2022, we have the 60-40 portfolio, that's where most people are, and we're trying to move into an incremental improvement from there. The question is, can we go from a framework of having to make an either or decision? And by that, I mean, I have to sell stocks or bonds to buy something else to an and framework where I'm allowed to be able to continue to hold my core 60-40 that I'm comfortable with and add something on top that I think will be an absolute return diversifier going forward. And that's where we want to use leverage. So we will be taking, increasing the notional exposure we have, but what we're trying to do with the use of leverage is add something on top that is diversifying to the risks that a core 60-40 portfolio has. Well, and, and so I just, I, I want to emphasize on this. There are also, and this goes to Harley's point earlier, right? There are multiple ways that leverage can be added to a portfolio, many of which are not available to retail, particularly to the RIA community, right? And so we all know this in one form or another that we could go out and we could use margin accounts to expand a portfolio. That's typ you're typically restricted from that in the RIA space. The... Um, the other way it can be done is by purchasing products like ETFs that offer 2x or 1.5x type exposure to the underlying, utilizing the types of risk or notional leverage that Harley referred to earlier, right? I can use Absolutely. futures contracts to increase my exposure. That becomes feasible in many situations, and it allows you to effectively pack in the same with the same amount of purchasing power, greater risk exposure. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly because I think a, a picture is worth a thousand words uh, when it comes to this sort of stuff. But basically what we have on the left is your traditional 60-40 portfolio. And this is exactly the idea you were talking about, Mike. So you've got a 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. And what we're going to do in this example is buy an ETF that provides 1.5 times leverage of a 60-40. And we're going to take two-thirds of our money and buy that 90-60 portfolio, right? Or the one that's now dashed lines between blue and green. 
and we're gonna have one third of our portfolio in cash. Now, in theory, this portfolio is identical. All we've done is we've taken that 60-40 and scrunched it down into a smaller position by using leverage internal to that position we're buying. And then the question becomes, well, what can I do with this cash? Because if I then unravel what I'm holding and invest that extra cash in something else, I've effectively stacked the returns on top of my core 60-40. And so when you think about the risk profile, like now why not just increase the 60-40 portfolio and the aggregate exposures by just scaling it up with leverage? Why choose to replicate that and then add something else? What's the benefit in your analysis there? So I think the core question comes back to what are we trying to do here with the 60-40? Certainly we're trying to enhance returns but I think if we can try to enhance returns and make the portfolio more resilient at the same time, well, that's sort of the dream goal. So when we look at a 60-40 portfolio, I think what becomes all too apparent, and again, we'll just use, we'll just say global equities and, and US bonds, which is sort of what I traditionally see when I consult with advisors. What's all too apparent is that portfolio is very, very sensitive to inflation shocks. And so when you have a portfolio that's very, very sensitive to inflation shocks, levering it up just makes it more sensitive to inflation shocks. Ultimately, what we want to do is try to find something that can stack some return on top, some return potential, and introduce a diversifying position. In my mind, ideally, we'd want to add something in that can, be, that can desensitize the portfolio to something like inflation. Because you're and looking so for a stacked investment that has a negative correlation to your 60-40 mix. Exactly. And how do you exactly. pick that? Well, so that's where you start to, to go through both the numbers and the theory, right? So if we know, if we look through and say, we know stocks and bonds typically um, are both positively correlated during inflationary environments, what tends to do well during inflationary environments? I think the thing most people jump to immediately is commodities. The problem with just stacking naked commodities on top of your 60-40, at least in my, port, in my opinion, is that commodities in and of themselves, I don't think have a positive expected return premium. Right? There, to me, there's no reason that just buying and holding commodities should have a positive expected return. So you're adding something that's got a whole lot of volatility with no positive expected return, perhaps it helps hedge against uh, inflation. But when you look at it in disinflationary environments, man, is it going to be a really big drag. And then when you start to consider, at least historically, the ratio of inflationary versus disinflationary environments in the US, well, the majority of the time we're in the latter camp. And so you're stacking something on top that actually the majority of the time is going to hurt you and add a lot of noise to your portfolio even though it does provide a hedge in that one inflationary environment, potentially. We don't have a lot of data to work with there. Well, I want to add something. Over here. You kind of glossed over it quickly, but it was, I think, like the second most important point we have here, which is capital efficiency. So when you're doing some kind of, you're adding leverage to your portfolio, nominal risk, however you want to do it, you're borrowing money. To, you have to be in some manner, fashion, or form. Um, there's lots of different ways to borrow that money to make the investment. Doing it in your margin account is probably the worst possible way to go and do it. But there's other ways, either invest it in some kind of fund that has it, because their cost is going to be much lower than yours as an individual. Uh, options, uh, in the money options, are an incredible way to gain leverage, um, not just for, for I, not just like risk leverage, just pure borrowing money, because by definition, um, Citadel, Susquehanna, James, all the big market makers out there, they're making these tight little penny markets um, to do that kind of trading. What they do is they lock up of the five option variables, they lock all of them up and just take the implied vol and move that up and down. That means they lock up the financing rate. And the rate they borrow at is the Citadel rate, which is basically LIBOR or treasuries, which no one can borrow but the government and those people. So when you use options or other kinds of uh, futures, listed futures, um, you're borrowing at the government rate. Um, 
Can you buy futures? Most of you can't, but if a future is embedded into a very inexpensive ETF, now you're being very clever because your borrowing cost is very small. And if your borrow cost is small, your hurdle rate to win is big. So I, I think we should really I think that's, focus in on that. That's spot on. It's a question I get a lot, which is what is the cost of leverage, right? And to your point, there's all sorts of different ways you can get leverage. Um, and you know, if you are a traditional individual investor and you try to go get leverage through uh, your broker, it's normally going to cost you hundreds of basis points. But when you get leverage through something like futures, you are ultimately uh, taking advantage of the balance sheet of a lot of the largest banks in the world who are counterparty to you. And they are competing to make this market as tight as possible. And so the implied financing cost of that leverage can be nearly identical to the cost of you know, what you would get in just a pure passive fund for equities or, or US Treasury. So these can be very, very cost efficient positions. I would say that the added benefit to doing this within a fund, right? So Corey can go out and buy the futures in his own account, or Corey can buy a fund that owns the futures, is that when the fund owns the futures, the leverage is ultimately non-recourse to me as the fund holder. And that's a big advantage that I know I cannot lose more than the money I put in the fund. Now, I would argue there would have to be truly disastrous events for the types of leverage we're talking about in treasury futures for a fund to go to zero. But if it's going to zero and I were I had the leverage myself with the futures, it's certainly going beyond that. And that could be a permanent impairment situation. So I think there's a huge advantage if you're trying to find the capital efficiency to try to find a fund that is implementing a low cost means of getting leverage and then utilizing the fund because it provides that nice non-recourse cushion. Uh -uh. I wanted to highlight the language that you used there, Corey, because I think this is actually really, really important. Um, there's two things that, that we pay a lot of attention to and we think about levered exposure in a fund, right? One is the appropriate use of leverage, right? So, you know, we've introduced strategies that employ a discounted leverage, right? So less than 100% leverage to underlying exposures for things like the VIX, where ultimately we recognize that a underlying asset with 100% volatility is simply too high high for most portfolio exposures, right? It's just too much risk to actually take on. Likewise, you can modify that by buying protection against the extreme moves where you are exposed to leverage, preventing events like an XIV type blow up, right? The second thing that matters, and you have been a primary proponent of, of the awareness of this, is the importance of rebalancing frequency. And so many of the volatility, many of the levered products that are common commonly deployed in the markets engage in daily leverage or daily rebalancing. Can you comment about the, the, how you think about that dynamic and, and what that means? Because my immediate reaction to that is that type of rebalancing frequency simply creates volatility drag. It creates, you know, effectively, if you just think about it in the simplest form, a fund that is up 10% one day, down 10% the next day, it's not equal, it's now lost money, right? right. Um, you want to minimize those types of transactions. It sounds like my I'm being told my sound is a little off, so I'm going to try to improve it. Yeah, you, you came through for me, and I know exactly where you're going, right? So there's when you look at levered funds that are in the market, the vast majority of them are daily reset. So for example, they're trying to get two times the daily return of the underlying or three times the daily return. And sometimes in other countries, it's even higher. When you're talking about taking leverage and applying it to a risky position like equities, you actually do need to reset more frequently to reduce the risk. The reason you really have to do that is all you have to think about is if your leverage is n times, or call it, you know, we'll use three as an example, all you need is a drawdown of 33% or one over three to be completely wiped out. So to avoid that risk, the funds reset very frequently because it resets the collateral to leverage ratio, making it harder for them to go bust. So from a fund management perspective, great, it's genius, and they get to sell it as a nice, clean trader's tool. You're getting you know, one times, two times daily return. From a buy and hold perspective, it gets hard to your point because it compounds that variance drag. 
and it does it um, exponentially as leverage goes up. So uh, if you have two times leveraged, it's sort of, you know, if your leverage is two times, you get basically four times the variance drag. If your leverage is three times, you get nine times the variance drag. If your leverage is four times, it's 16 times the variance drag. And that variance drag compounds significantly over time as an asset exhibits more of that sort of whipsaw behavior. So it can become uh, very difficult from a buy and hold perspective because the market might be up 20%, but you might actually have a levered fund that underperforms the market because the path the market took uh, ended up creating a, a situation where that variance drag overwhelmed the underlying return drift that you had. So it's ultimately what's happening is you're embedding a huge amount of path dependency the more frequently you reset that leverage. I actually am going to share. I'm going to, I'm going to share my slide for one second, um, Harley, because I just want to show the audience um, an almost perfect example of what we're discussing here. Um, so this is, and I apologize that it's not as clean as my charts usually are. But then again, uh, for those who don't know, I am down with coronavirus, so I'm 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 operating on uh, on, on fumes here. This is actually looking at the S&P 500 in the orange line. And the blue line is the exact same average daily return that the S&P realized over the period from 1987 until today, but done with zero variance, and effectively saying the same return every single day, right? So if I take the average daily return, it gives me the exact same number. But when I accumulate it because of the zero variance, you discover that my overall returns are almost twice as high over that time period, right? This is functionally what, what, Cor what Corey is highlighting when we talk about this dynamic of variance drag. The more I rebalance a portfolio that has positive variance to it, the lower this relative return versus a theoretical framework at zero variance is going to end up being, right? And when you use leverage, it becomes really important to understand that you're magnifying these results. Does that make sense? I would just jump in and say that we really have to really dot the I here that these various ETFs that work upon percent returns are great if you're gonna trade for three or four days. If you're longer than that, you're in the wrong product. And this is why uh, at, at Simplify, we put the actual options or, or other instruments in there and you get a, a, a real return. Um, uh, I, I mean, you're, I could go off a long time on this thing, but I would just urge you to be very, very careful. If you, want, if you go buy these, like a 3X product over there, um, uh, you're probably pretty sorry uh, over the course of time. You're better off just buying deep in the money options uh, and just letting them run. Uh, that, that, that's exactly why I built that return stream to illustrate this dynamic, right? If I use the leverage of an in the money call option, I'm going to get a radically different result than I would with the higher variance rebalancing dynamic. Um, okay, so Corey, we, we've brought in the idea of, of generating additional return. One of the questions that's come in that I wanted to take a second to address is how does this concept of return stacking differ from the language of portable alpha that we've heard before? So I would say it really doesn't. And I actually used to call this portable beta when I was writing about it four years ago. Capital efficiency, portable alpha, portable beta, return stacking. It's all leverage, right? I actually particularly like the phrase return stacking because I think it really illuminates um, and makes it really transparent when things are going to go right and when things are going, are going to go wrong. It's just basically uh, addition math, right? Return of what you're holding yep. plus return of what you're stacking on. If they're both negative, it's not good. If it, they're both positive, it's great. And ideally, over time, you've got low correlation there. What we used to see on the institutional side with portable alpha is a lot of this was achieved with long short equity funds, or you were posting a little bit of collateral, and they were using that um, to, to access future strategies. I would argue this is much the same. It just was not possible for individual investors until maybe two years ago. Uh, 
Two years ago, there started to be funds, ETFs and mutual funds that came to market with the embedded leverage that provided the capital efficiency that made this possible. And then it's just really a question of how are you taking all the ingredients and mixing them around to get the exposures you want? So, and, and, and I just want to highlight that the language of portable alpha, right, it implies a judgment component associated with it. It's actually tied back, as I understand it, to the work of Cliff Asnes and others highlighting things like the betting against beta portfolios, right? So the idea was fairly straightforward that most firms particularly in that environment, could not access leverage. And so leverage itself became a source of alpha. It would allow me to take a less risky portfolio and scale it up to similar risk levels as a more traditional risky portfolio. The entire thesis behind betting against beta was that the excess returns to the quality factor or to the low beta factor were a function of people who couldn't access leverage paying a premium for stocks that had that leverage embedded in it, right? So the language of portable alpha for me is one that doesn't actually work, right? There's no evidence that there's alpha associated with that. And particularly as Corey highlighted about two years ago and, and really much more recently, it's become feasible for retail portfolios to begin to replicate a lot of this through fund selection. Does that feel fair? At least in my experience, I would say portable alpha on the institutional side goes beyond just what Cliff and his team wrote about with, with betting against beta and similar concepts. It really was a portfolio construction tool about capital efficiency, particularly towards alpha-like strategies that could be implemented in a capital efficient way, like a long short equity strategy. Right. And the whole idea was, hey, go buy your cheap beta. We only need a little bit of margin to do this big, fat, long, short equity strategy or this future strategy. Um, and, and whether that alpha could be realized or not was another question, but it was an idea around capital efficiency um, and that managers could implement pure alpha strategies in a very capital efficient way. Again, that was very isolated to what institutions were able to do. Um, akin to the 13030 funds that were popular you know, pre two thousand eight, and then yeah, went out. Went well, out. Popular of is a very dangerous term there. So I actually launched and introduced the one thirty thirty funds at Royce and Associates, and there just was never really any demand for those types of structures. In part because the managers themselves tended to resist putting on that leverage, right? They, they would often use it to really just express a long portfolio component, or to try to attract additional fee dynamics to it with the idea that there were degrees of freedom that were created that allowed the manager to excel. I also like your description of portable beta because one of the things that's emerged and, and part of the bugaboo that has harmed the portable alpha theme is exactly that capture of alpha, right? The beta component has dominated under most regimes. So let's jump into the area that I know Harley wants to hit on, which is how do you think about constructing these portfolios with these incremental returns in an environment in which the correlation regime could change markedly? And I just wanted to bring up a chart that shows, and this is so, I've got, we've got multiple variants of this, um, but this is looking at kind of the rolling three-year correlation between bonds and equities over time. And Part of what's so fascinating about what's transpired is, is that we effectively had relatively stable positive correlations where bonds behaved as a discounting mechanism and equities typically referred to the bond interest rate as a um, component in a CAPM type formula or a dividend discount type formula where there was a relationship, the higher the interest rate went, the more negative it was for an equity. That actually hit a peak as we came into the 1997 Asian crisis. And then in the aftermath of those events, we've seen it flip even more violently in the opposite direction to the point that today, and this goes to, I think, one of Harley's key concerns, are we facing a risk that the regime of correlation that we have seen flips violently in the other direction and requires portfolios to be re reconstituted in a, in a substantive way? 
and I know Harley is itching for me to show the, the, the next chart, uh, which is one of his, that I, or actually, I'm sorry, Gerald Manack, highlights the dynamic that the relationship between um, bonds and equities seems to be tied to the level of inflation. Now, I personally don't believe this, but there is, you know, there is a question of, is the Fed finally being backed into a corner with the renewal of inflation that's come through the coronavirus dynamic? Harley, do you want to jump in or do you want me to jump in? You, you start. Yeah, so I guess what I would say is that, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, I don't find charts like this particularly profound because any finance 101 student who has done a discounted cash flow analysis would know that both stocks and bonds are sensitive to real rates. And so when the market is concerned about inflation shocks, you should expect that correlations between stocks and bonds go up, right? So to me, this is like, I don't think there's some magic level where all of a sudden, you know, nominal rates hit a certain level or go below a certain level or inflation hits a level. To me, it's about what is the risk that the market is perceiving and how is it going to price that shock into equities and bonds? So if we do enter an environment, again, where inflation is the headline risk, I expect stocks and bonds to exhibit positive correlation. And, and so I would argue if your answer out of the uh, how do you get escape a you know, low return 6040 environment is just to lever up your 6040, well, you're taking a tremendous amount of correlation risk there. And that's certainly not what we want to do. What we want to do is use leverage thoughtfully to introduce something that can de-risk that inflation uh, risk. Corey, are, are, when you were, and let's be clear, return stacking, portable alpha, risk parity, uh, margin leverage, it's all the same thing in the end, um, just different ways of going about it. So in case people were curious, they're, they're all the same thing. Is the goal here, the way you're attacking the problem, to hold the risk the same and increase the return or to hold the return constant and reduce the risk? Like, what is the, what is the overall notion here? Yeah, Mike, you mind if I share, share a picture? Not at all. Let me yeah. turn that off. And, and Harley, I will uh, disagree with your take on risk parity in a moment. But the picture we're trying to achieve here is ultimately what we would call sort of a Z shift, right? That when you begin with your traditional portfolio down here on the bottom right, that point one, that's your traditional stock bond portfolio. What we have historically found over the last decade is when you introduce diversifiers to that mix, a lot of the diversifiers that are available tend to be absolute return. They do provide lower correlation structurally to stocks and bonds, but they have sacrifice return. So you've actually really moved the portfolio down to the left, right? By introducing other asset classes or other investment strategies, you take some return off the table and you reduce the risk. The idea is to use leverage to get back up to an appropriate risk level that hopefully by going back to the risk level of approximately the traditional portfolio, we're actually unlocking the benefits of diversification and getting to a return level that is above the traditional portfolio. And then sort of the last piece of these structural alpha models that we built is the recognition that the real um, risk factor that we introduce with something like leverage is that correlation crash. And that tends to happen in a liquidity event where nothing is safe. And so what we want to introduce are some tail hedges, which will almost certainly reduce our return when the tail hedges aren't net needed, but will hopefully provide uh, dramatic protection during those sort of March 2020 liquidation cascades. So this is actually something that I would emphasize as well, and it goes to this issue of correlation. And several people have brought this into the Q and A. It, it, you know, one of the key risks that you run on a on a portfolio that is constructed in a risk parity or correlation based framework, right? Um, and again, I understand that, that there's some distinctions around that, but when you're using proxy hedges, right? So a bond to protect a portfolio as compared to a put to protect an equity portfolio, you raise the risk that that hedge fails at exactly the wrong moment for you, right? And that in turn, that failure, and this goes exactly to the point that people are raising, 
that failure causes portfolio unwinds that then further exacerbates the condition. Effectively, it was called the basis blows out, right? Uh, when you think about your very clear articulation there of tail hedges, are, are you emphasizing this feature, right? I mean, this is part of the reason why you looked at products that have embedded tail protection. I wanna emphasize that component, whether it's an S&P, for example, against an S&P exposure or a Russell 2000 put against a Russell 2000 exposure. Once you've added leverage into the mix, that basis takes on incremental you know, uh, importance. And it, at least in the way I think about the world, it becomes increasingly important to hedge with the actual negative payoff associated with that asset. I think that's spot on. So I, I'll share a couple screens really quickly because I think what I haven't addressed is, okay, what do we stack on the portfolio, right? Yep. So what I what I said before, and all you really need to focus on with this picture is that that big red box. What we're looking at in this grid are how sensitive are equities, treasuries, and a 60-40 to growth and inflation surprises. And what you find is that neither does particularly well with inflation surprises, and that's on the right side. Nothing shows up in a traditional 60-40 portfolio as performing well. They all have sort of a negative beta to inflation surprises. This is exactly what we've said, right? So, so we talked about commodities. Just to highlight really quickly, the reason we don't want to necessarily stack commodities, add things like gold, is that even though they've historically done really well during inflationary environments, they've done almost nothing during other or disinflationary environments. They've had slightly negative returns with a lot of volatility. And that other case has happened 80% of the time over the last 100, 120 years in US markets. Who knows what will happen going forward, but this is the potential problem. What we found is that if you look at things like systematic trend following, so CTAs or managed futures, that they don't do as well as commodities, but they do offer historically positive returns during the disinflationary shock environments as well. And so if you were to plot sort of returns in different regimes for different asset classes, what you see here is that U.S. Treasuries, which is the second from the left, tends to do pretty well when there's a downside inflationary surprise, but poorly in the green bar when there's a positive upside inflationary surprise. Commodities are the exact opposite, and that's why they're a great hedge. But all that's really going to do is hurt your return in both environments. Whereas things like um, momentum, macro momentum and commodity trend tends to exhibit this more smile, absolute return-like behavior in any sort of inflationary regime. And so that to us is what we wanted to stack on top. We wanted the 60-40 and then stack on top some CTA style exposure. Now back to your point though, that is introducing some basis risk. There is a correlation assumption that these managers are going to be able to systematically trade in a way that does not necessarily put them in the wrong position when a crisis occurs. And there's no guarantee that happens. And so to hedge that risk that they are long bonds and long stocks and maybe short commodities at a time when there's a strong inflation uh, uh, surprise, we need hedges in the portfolio very specifically on stocks and bonds. We don't want to, we don't want to take just that basis risk when we're introducing the leverage. So a good example of that, just very quickly, would be a, you know, and we, we've seen an example of this play out this year. Own tips, even though we may hate the return profile of tips, relative to say payer swaption, right? Um, the steepener trade in the second half of 2021 turned disastrous for the macro community because people had operated the assumption that bond vigilantism would show up in one form or another and higher inflation would translate to higher yields, right? That failed as a strategy, at least on a, on a short-term basis, right? So that would be a good example of where you might hate something, right? And generally, we would argue that puts tend to be relatively expensive, but represent the exact same payoff profile dynamics within the equity space. So it may not offer you the same sort of 
of positive carry or expected return that you can capture from a um, uh, a strategy of trend following, for example, but it does dispense with the risk that you got it wrong in the implementation. Is that does that sound fair? I think that does sound fair. I would only caveat that at least historically, something like tips explicitly tend to be kind of a neutral response to inflation okay. and disinflationary shocks. So they don't tend to do anything in either direction. Uh, whereas commodities have a much stronger response in both directions. So CTAs who can systematically trade commodities and commodity currencies potentially have the opportunity to sort of surf those trends. Perfect. Mike, you're not okay. going to throw me out the, the tips, are you? No, I am not going to start. Corey and I are not going to gang up on you and, and pitch tips. Um, okay, so Corey, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the actual examples of, of what you are stacking and how you're building portfolios, because as Brian alluded to at the, at the start, like one of the more challenging components for RIAs and other investors is how do you actually start to put the pieces of the puzzle together? Right. And so that's exactly what we wanted to address with this is there are a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of new funds coming to market that either create this capital efficiency, provide this sort of alternative exposure, embed um, optionality and convexity, these hedges that we want. And so what we did is we surveyed the landscape, tried to find the products that we thought gave us the exposures we wanted and could create the traditional investor risk profiles. So we built out four models, sort of a conservative 2080, a um, sort of a conservative moderate uh, 4060, a moderate growth 6040, and a growth portfolio 8020. And the big difference you will see, and we'll focus on say the 6040, is that our 6040 actually has an extra 25% notional exposure. So our 6040 is actually a 70 40 15. 70% 70 stocks, 40% bonds, 15% alternatives. Here, very specifically, uh, managed futures and those extra stocks that we've added on top have that embedded put protection within them. Fantastic. Okay. And these portfolios and the actual descriptions of them will be available to anyone who registers with Simplify. You can find them on our website. You can find them through um, newfound research, et cetera, right? Yep. If you How does to... somebody gain access to these models? Yep. So right now they're available to institutional investors and investment professionals. So financial advisors, um, if you go to thinknewfound.com and go under model portfolios, you'll see the structural alpha model series. You just have to register and our team will just go in and confirm you are who you say you are and then approve you. Individuals right now, unfortunately, for compliance and regulatory reasons, we can't provide the model allocations to individuals. We're working on a solution to that. So if you're an individual who's interested, you can subscribe. We can't show you the models right now, but we'll have you on the list and we'll give you an update as soon as we can solve that problem. And now you do your compliance and analysis and uh, CYA type work on the blockchain using Bitcoin, right? Absolutely. It's absolutely Perfect. solved by blockchain okay. technology. Oh, I, it makes me so happy. Okay. So um, let's open it up to a couple of uh, questions that have come in through the Q&A. Um, one of which is actually one that I love, and it came from Woody Wigman, who I know follows me on Twitter, and I appreciate him being here. Um, he says, why the hell would you even bother with treasuries? Like, what's the point? And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you my answer to that, which is um, e as much as we may hate the low return associated with it, it is an incredible tool to be able to say, you will deliver me X amount of cash at a very specific date in the future with zero collateral risk effectively, right? Or zero counterparty risk associated with it. That is a really, really important feature in a portfolio. Would you answer differently? Is there, is there another reason for it at these, at these levels? I think there's, from a return perspective, it's very difficult to justify. And from a correlation perspective, it's potentially getting more difficult to justify unless you believe that the Fed will always be there to lower interest rates during a crisis, in which case you can argue it is sort of in a weird way a put, right? Um, right? And so there's a, there's a conditional correlation argument there. But I agree with you from a behavioral perspective, 
candidly, when you're working with a financial advisor who has allocated to traditional asset allocation models for the last 20 years, there's only so far we can move off of that from a client comfort perspective, from an advisor business risk perspective, not many are willing to wholesale flip what they're doing. And so they've been trying to dance around the edges. They've been trying to add active stock selection or tactical asset allocation or alternatives to try to dance around the edges of these problems. What we're trying to do is, is sort of throw all that away and say, we'd rather just go for a structurally enhanced solution, something that's trying to pursue these um, improvements, not through alpha, but through structural means while still giving them the comfort that that core strategic asset allocation profile they selected for the client is intact. In many ways, you know, treasuries at this stage of the game are almost a cash substitute. And cash is, if you think about it, the cheapest option out there because relatively it costs you zero to hold it, uh, notwithstanding paper money going to zero. Um, and, and, and considering the, the inflection point we're at with the economy and, 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 and inflation and stock valuations, uh, owning treasuries now or cash now gives you ammo in case things really go haywire. So if you do get a March 2020 again, you won't be over your skis and selling. You'll have you know cash in the, in your pocket to go actually buy something that's interesting when everything gets flushed. But I think Mike, we should, we should go back to that the, the slide again on correlation, the second one. And Corey, I will push back on you. I think there is a number, and that number is somewhere around four percent. Um, and the reason why the next one. Um, I, 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 um, well, over, over Next time. one. Okay. Over here, what's, you can see, this is a better way of seeing how we've seen these uh, correlations moving over time. Why? Why four percent seems to be the number that we kind of get from most dealers. It's all. It's all the same number. It's all the same data. It is really when you have inflation coming in and rates are low, you increase earnings, and the discount rate, which is your PE, doesn't change. But at a certain point, the discount rate becomes impactful. And that's when they both go down. And if you look at the last two big drawdowns we've had um, in March 2020 and in uh, December 18, both of those were when you had stocks and bonds going down together. And so I would caution people that the way you get your incremental leverage, and I think, Corey, you're, you're, you're right on the screws, the way you're, 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 you're bringing in the leverage in terms of uncorrelated assets and non-recourse by putting long option positions embedded into these ETFs. Um, I, I, I fully subscribe to that because if we do get rates up in this four area, I'm not saying we will, if we do, it's gonna be a very sad day because all these risk parity, pure levered funds are, are, are gonna have to uh, unwind. Um, the big question for all of us macro guys, um, which I have no answer for yet is, I promise you inflation is going up. It's up, it's staying up, it's not going down. It's not going to Zimbabwe, it'll be you know three, four for the next number of years. But we used to have linkage of rates to inflation and that has not existed so far. And by the way, it may not exist going forward either. And if that's the case, it becomes very interesting how everything plays out because if we get low rates and high inflation, that's very bullish for stocks. All right. I know we have five minutes left. I, I have to push back on this risk parity thing, Mike. You got to let me do it. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to say my Go piece really quickly. Risk parity is not levered stocks and bonds. Levered stocks and bonds is levered stocks is, is, is its own thing. Risk parity is going to include, by definition, other asset classes that may do well when stocks and bonds go down, like commodity currencies or, or explicit commodities. And so there's two points here. One, yes, a levered stock bond portfolio will suffer if correlations go up and stocks and bonds go down at the same time. But as I talked about, that should be an environment where commodities could potentially do very well. Point one. Point two is that the way these strategies are run in practice is that they are measuring on an ongoing basis both the internal diversification within the portfolio as well as the external realized volatility. So if the correlation between stocks and bonds goes up, risk parity portfolios will decrease the amount of exposure they have to stocks and bonds because it represents an overlapping bet. And how do they and, do that? Well, they'll have to sell stocks and bonds. Ah, they sell and they sell, they have 200 assets for hundred bucks in cash. They're selling, they're not buying. They will trim, absolutely. But right from a portfolio perspective, that could be offset by gains, right? 
in other exposures. So all I'm saying is, yes, you are absolutely correct. Correlation risk is, an, is a big problem for a levered stock bond portfolio. Risk parity portfolios are not just levered stock bond portfolios. Okay, you know what? When you go to the Red Lobster, you could buy a hamburger there. But you know what? That's not where you go into the Red Lobster. Okay, so when you say I risk don't even parity, know what that means, Harley. When, when people say risk parity, they mean levered stocks and bonds. They don't mean some clever idea of adding in CTA. What do you mean clever idea? That is no, no, no. But the that's what you're the doing. The standard like. Bridgewater, the standard Bridgewater risk parity portfolio includes a a whole palette of different asset classes beyond just stocks and bonds. No risk parity mandate in the world is just stocks and bonds. No one has ever meant just stocks and bonds when they said risk parity. Okay. So the reason the reason why I'm going to split the baby between you two, right, is um, clearly Corey is correct. In a, in a true risk parity implementation, what you've actually done is scaled up the individual assets so that they have similar contribution to the volatility of the portfolio. You're introducing diversified assets, things like uh, commodities, things like equities, things like bonds, things like FX exposures, long volatility, et cetera, right? So you are introducing more of the aspects that are also similar to some of the language that we've heard, like a permanent portfolio. Where I would agree with Harley is the specific implementation tends to take the form of targeting a degree of volatility. And so when the correlations change or when the volatilities in the underlying assets rise, for example, during a recessionary environment where there's greater uncertainty, right, it can lead to a coordinated sell-off of levered portfolios that exacerbates market conditions. And that, you know, so the distinction between the systemic risk associated with a broad implementation and everybody adopting risk parity-like portfolios and the specific risk to an individual portfolio are actually two separate things, but both equally valid. I will agree with you 100% on that. It just seems okay. like a weird coincidence that both times we've had correlations go flip, uh, we had to have the Fed come in to save the day or we're all going to jump out the window. I, I actually don't think, I don't think that's a coincidence at all. I think that, that you are correctly hitting on the systemic implications of broad adoption of large scale risk parity type portfolios in which it is actually presumed that the correlation is going to remain relatively stable because your exposure has been scaled up to reflect and that. And so you need to reduce it. The portfolios that you're advertising, Corey, I mean, they do have 60-40 levered up. I mean, it's mostly 60-40, mostly stocks and bonds. There might be a, a few bells and whistles added to it, but I, I think saying risk parity is levered stocks and bonds is a pretty, I think I'm capturing the, uh, the, the zeitgeist of the, of the notion. All right, well, let me drop my grenade. And, and again, I, I, I just want to I want to interject because I know you two are going to fight on this subject, right? But the 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 yes, it captures elements of the zeitgeist. And yes, it is also explicitly what you're referring to, Harley, is called the risk parity light type dynamic, right? It is an abbreviation of the portfolio construction technique that does do a good job of simulating exactly what you're focused on, which is the systemic risk associated with that. I also just wanted to I, I wanted to close with with one last slide because I think Harley hit on this and and again you know it wouldn't be a uh, it wouldn't be a keeping it simple without Mike Green tossing in it's complicated right and so the same chart that Harley showed earlier that I showed actually from Anac Advisors that looked at the return profile in correlation since 1960 here's that same chart from 1871 right so like. The reality is we don't know. We just don't know what is going to happen going forward. We could enter into a regime in which there is positive correlation with very high levels of inflation. It ultimately is going to depend in part on what the Fed feels that it's forced to do. And that feels like the single most important development that we're kind of facing. And I really wanted to plug that next, keeping it simple, we're going to be sitting down with Lacey Hunt to talk about the inflationary dynamics. I want to emphasize that we just don't know for certain right now. And so we're really going to be trying to dig into that. And this was a great introduction to that topic. Please make sure that you register for it. And I'm going to hand it over to Brian, who's going to relieve me of my duties. One last thing, I just want to be very clear, despite me punching around here, of the ways to use leverage and capital efficiency, I think what Corey's proposed is the best way out there. All right, that's a great note to close I agree. on. But
Corey, Harley, Harley, and Mike, this was an awesome conversation. Mike, I think Harley's mom is going to be mad at you for teaming up on her, her little boy again. Uh, but this was a great conversation. Audience, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as Corey mentioned, you can find more information at thinknewfound.com uh, on the model portfolios. And then, as Mike mentioned, Lacey Hunt will be joining us on Thursday, February 10th. Same bat time, same bat channel. Everyone have a great evening. This was a great conversation. Thanks for joining us.